refrigerator door on the face of this planet makes the same sound when the rubber separates from the other parts, right? You know, I can't even duplicate that sound, but if you hear it, you know, uh-oh, someone opened the fridge, right? It's a universal sound. You understand? Universal. Okay? If there were refrigerators in heaven, it'd still sound the same. Okay? So open. I heard the fridge door open. And then I heard the second universal sound. Exactly. The sound that every Coca-Cola bottle makes in the entire planet when you open it. It's the sound, right? You know that sound, right? When you hear that sound, you get excited, right? But the important thing is, the third most universal sound is the problem. It's the universal sound of a two-liter bottle hitting the floor. Toom, toom, toom. So three universal sounds in two minutes. So what do you think happened? Huh? What do you think happened? There was a flash flood of coke in my room. But then all of a sudden, I know what happened. I don't have to be in the room to know what happened. I know what happened. But I wanted to see what my son was going to do about this. I was kind of curious. Five years old, how is he going to solve this problem? This is life skills training right here. This is like... This is like, you know, National Geographic. You know, like the, the deer is born and then like 10 minutes later it's going to start running away from a lion, you know. So I was thinking, like, what is he going to do? And then all of a sudden he comes out and his clothes are all wet. But he wasn't expecting me to be at the door because he thought I left. But as soon as he came out of the door, I was standing there. He looked at me and his Coca-Cola drenched hands like went right behind his back like this. I was like, what's going on? Everything okay? He, goes, he starts walking sideways like this. He goes all the way to the bathroom. And when he goes into the bathroom, he pulls out a little wad of toilet paper in his little bitty five-year-old hands. And then he goes back into the room. Now I know what he's doing. He's trying to wipe up two liters of Coke with a little wad of like toilet paper. So then he comes back out, and he does it again, walks sideways into the bathroom and pulls out another water pour toilet paper. He does this three times, and then finally he gets smart. He brings the whole roll of toilet paper this time. <laughs> so when he goes in, I say, okay, now I got to step in, and I got to take care of this problem. When I open the door, you know, if you had a whole roll of toilet paper, what would you do? You would take it, like, in bunches, and then, like, Bunches, and then like bunches, and then you like put it all over the place, right? But my son was even smarter. He took the toilet roll, put it in the Coke, and started rolling the roll in the Coke to absorb it, right? It's called creative thinking. He gets that from me. So what happened was, I looked at him, and then I saw it. He's just like swimming in Coke, trying to absorb it, and the toilet paper roll is all brown, so I was like, John, what are you doing? He got up. What do you think the first thing he did was? Father, I'm very sorry for doing this. I'm, I, I understood that I misunderstood your heart, and so therefore I made this mistake. Please forgive me and help me with this problem. You think he said that? What do you think he did? He did the fourth universal sound. You can be in Africa. You can be in China. You can be in Russia. And that I just got caught doing something bad, cry, is universal. You know what that cry is like on a five-year-old? It's the same on a two-year-old, same on a three-year-old. You know what it is? It's that slow motion cry. It's the, uh, and it goes up, it goes, uh, you know what I'm talking about? It's universal. That is how we can know that there is no black, no white, no Korean, no red. We're all humans. Because we have that same cry when we get in trouble at five years old. Uh, it's not like a motorcycle. Like a, uh. <laughs> so everyone, this is what I want to ask you. Okay, Before I tell you what happens next, I want to ask you something. Okay, 
Why was, what do you think my son was going through his mind, going through his heart? Right? At five years old, he probably thought it was the end of his short life, right? Oh, when my father comes in here, I'm not going to make it to six. This is it. This is my last rodeo. It's over. Right? He thought the world was ending, right? Could you imagine all the panic in his heart? Right? This overwhelming flood of coke. And then all he has is this little wad of toilet paper. And I got to take care of this problem before my father gets here. Because if my father gets here, he's going to turn into the dragon man and kill me. So he's struggling in pain. So tell you the truth. Did I forgive him or not? Of course, he's here. He's alive. He's in one of your groups right now. Right? If I didn't forgive him, he'd be like, you know, I take off, you know, his left arm, you know. Everyone, this is important. I already forgave my son, right? But when did I forgive my son? That's important. When? See, the reason why faith is very, very difficult and vague is because everybody is self-centered. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everybody is self-centered. You're saying, no, Pastor Terry, no, oh, I take care of my brothers. I take care. That's not what I'm talking about. You take care of your brothers because you probably got beat if you didn't when you were young. So it's still self-centered. It's self-preservation. Understand? Or you may do it because it makes you feel better. But everything we do, humans do, is very self-centered. Everybody understand? Why do you go to college? Because you love knowledge? I don't think so. You go to college because you want to get what? You want to get paid later, right? Isn't it? That's the only reason why you go to the same school for four years. Isn't it? Don't you think so? Yeah. But when you were in elementary, middle school, and high school, why would you go to school? Because if I did it, my dad would kill me. That's a different motivation. So everyone, everybody is self-centered. This is the problem. So... When it comes to forgiveness and when it comes to having faith in God, your biggest problem is that you are self-centered. That's the only confusion that remains is that you are self-centered, which means if you think something is impossible, then it must be impossible. And because you believe this so strongly, you cannot trust. Now, this is what Satan does. Satan doesn't just deceive us over one instant, Satan deceives us with a long-term plan, like a 20-year plan, like a 30-year old, like a 30-year plan. You understand? Have you ever trusted a friend and that friend let you down? Yes? Yes, right? Have you ever trusted yourself and you let yourself down? Yes, right? So if you start to trust people, you start to trust yourself, what happens? You set yourself up to fail. Why? Because all people are not perfect, right? So as you get, as uh, one person fails, as you trust this person and that person fails you, as you trust yourself, you fail yourself, what happens? You start to have something called distrust. It's not easy to trust. And then when you start looking at yourself, like for example, if I come to, what's your name in the front? The one with the pink, yes. Yes, you, right there. Yes, you. Who? Mercy. Okay. Sorry, I don't read lips. It's like, mercy. Right? You can be confident. Her name is Mercy. That is a pretty awesome name. So let's say, Mercy, do you enjoy my sermons? The ones that you're awake for? Yeah? Yeah, right. It's okay, right? All right. I look like a nice guy, right? Not bad. It's because I'm a good actor. But let's say, for example, okay, I get angry with you because you slept during my sermon. I mean, you're not sleeping now. Yeah. But let's say you get angry. I get angry and I go, how dare you sleep at my sermon? And whoosh, I slap you. Okay? It's only hypothetical. I'm not going to do that. Don't worry. Maybe row three. Where'd you go? Okay, but anyway, let's say I slap you. But then I feel bad about it. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I mean, anybody could sleep, you know. 
I know you're tired, and you slept in the Hilt, what was it, with the Hyatt? I know it's like so low of a hotel. It must be uncomfortable for you. I know you're tired. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. Can you forgive me? Yeah, of course. Why? Because her name is Mercy. <laughs> she will have mercy on me, right? <laughs> Am I right? You have to because that's your name, right? But let's say, for example, I slap you again, okay? <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's just my emotion, you know, I'm so emotional, you know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Are you going to forgive me second time? Of course. Because her name is Mercy. Right? We're going to slap you again third time. And then a the fourth time. And then a the fifth time. And then a the sixth time. And I slap you ten times. What's going to happen? I'm not going to make it to ten times, right? You're not just going to sit there and go, oh, oh, it's okay, I forgive you. Oh, it's okay, I forgive you. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Oh, you can happen to anyone. No, you're not going to do that, right? Isn't it? What do you think? Yeah, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to change your name from mercy to death, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Mercy to muerte, right, in Spanish, yes? So here's what I'm telling you. You and I, now think about this. If you know how you are, right, don't you think that I'm the same even though I'm a pastor? Right? So since I'm a pastor, I must be like an angel, right? The next best thing. Right? Pastor Terry never gets angry. Never yells at his wife, right? No, that's not true. At all. Right? So if you are that way, then shouldn't I be that way? Isn't Pastor Terry going to be that way? Pastor Terry's a human, right? He's a pastor, but he's still a man, right? So you are that way. I am that way. Every human being is that way, right? Isn't it? But the problem is you think God is that way. That is why you can't understand the concept that Jesus forgave you forever. Why? Because you cannot forgive someone forever. You understand? So what you're basing your understanding of God on is already incorrect from the beginning. Because you're self-centered. You are making God into the image of man. That is why you cannot trust God because you think God is the same as man. You tried to trust yourself, you failed yourself. You trusted your mother, sometimes your mother fails you. Your mother says, okay, don't worry, don't worry, I'll pick that thing up that you wanted after school. And then you come home and say, oh, I forgot. It happens, right? Yeah. Why? Because when you get older, you just forget. I'm so thankful every day that I remember who my kids are. Sometimes at the moment I can't think of their names, so I, that's why I gave them a number. You understand? So you've been failed by your parents, even by your teachers, right? Sometimes your teacher goes, hey, why did you do that? But it wasn't you. It was the person next to you, but they just blame you. And they don't want to listen to you, right? You've, had, you've experienced that before, right? Yeah. So you've been failed. People have failed you. You have failed yourself. And because you experienced this, you believe God is going to fail you too. You understand? That's why you cannot believe in God centered on yourself. It's a completely different person. And he's not even a, a person. You can lie, right? I can lie. God can do anything in this world except he cannot lie. You understand? God cannot lie. He physically cannot do it. You understand? God cannot lie. If God says something, it's what he really is. It's what he really believes. It's his true heart. So if God says he forgives you, God cannot lie. If God says, I have washed you, and you still have sin, God lied, didn't he? Didn't he? So if God says you are clean, if God says you are righteous, if God says that I have cleansed you, 
and he didn't clean you, then God's a liar. Isn't it? But the problem is, this is how we are, right? You look at me and you go, oh, Pastor Terry. You know, I see in the hallway, many of you are like, oh, hello, Pastor Terry, right? But strangely, on the first day, you did it so innocently. Oh, hey, Pastor Terry. Oh, hello. How are you? Hi, Pastor Terry. Oh, no. Hi, Pastor Terry. But after I told you my secret, your greeting is not pure anymore. Now you go, hello, Pastor Terry. So with your mouth, you're going, hey, Pastor Terry. With your mind, you're going, I don't see it. Where's the hairline? <laughs> it looks so real. That's what you're thinking. So before, you used to look me in my face and go, hey, Pastor Terry. Now your eye go. <laughs> and then when you pass by, you just go into the auditorium. But now when you pass by, you're like looking from the back. Like, People lie, isn't it? And they hide their heart, don't they? Right? Yeah. That's why I'm still married. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't be married right now. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> My wife comes with a new hairstyle. What do you think? Beautiful. I can't tell what I really think. Why? Because that's unnecessary destruction of peace in your household. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to lie, what do you do? You just what we call avoid the truth. How's my hair, honey? You can have any hairstyle you want. I will still love you. I didn't marry your hair. I married you. <laughs> it works. I mean, it's true, though. I didn't marry her hair. I married her. I may not agree with her hairstyle currently, but I know hair grows back. So technically, I didn't lie. I just avoided the complete truth. Right? Now, that's how we rationalize. Even That's what I'm saying. So even though it's funny even though sometimes it's for the peace of the universe, but we do lie, right? People can't hide their heart. But the problem is when it comes to God, we think God thinks the same way that we think. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody understand? That's your problem. That's why we can't believe in God. That's why we cannot believe in God. There's so many stories in the Bible like this. Joseph, you ever heard of Joseph? Joseph was betrayed by his 10 or yeah, 10 brothers because there's 12 boys in that family. He was number 11. Number 12 wasn't well, he was a little kid then. So his older 10 brothers betrayed him. They beat him and sold him as a slave into Egypt. Right? I know you have wars with your own brothers and sisters, right? Especially over the bathrooms in the morning. But have you ever made a plan to actually kidnap, attack, and sell your brother and sister as a slave? Have you done that before? If you have, it's okay. It's over now. The past is the past. Let's move on. Okay? I'm joking. You didn't do it yet, right? But this is what I'm talking to you. <clears throat> Joseph's brothers actually did it. They beat him, threw him in a pit. First, they were talking. I mean, he's right there. You know, like, don't you hate people who talk about you in the third person when you're standing right next to them? Hey, what should we do with this guy? I don't know. Let's kill him. You want to do that? Yeah, it's more convenient. Because if, like, we beat him, he's going to tell dad. He's going to tell on dad about it. So let's, let's kill him and kill all the elephants. What do you think? And Joe's like, dude, I'm right here. I hear you. He's like, shut up, dude. And then he's like, hey, you want to use a knife or do you want to use a rock? So they're, like, planning how to kill him in front of him. And then one of his brothers says, hey, let's not kill him. Let's make some money off this. Let's sell him. Hey, that's a good idea. 
So they were traveling people and they sold their own brother. So Joseph went to Egypt. Why did he go to Egypt? Because he had a vacation plan with TripAdvisor.com? No. He was sold into slavery, right? So he, he was torn away from his father, torn away from his mother, torn away from his house, and now he's a slave. He went and he was bought by a man named Potiphar. And as Potiphar bought him, he was working as a slave. I don't think they treated him right. Last time I checked, slaves don't really get treated well. Okay, slave number 12, if you want to wake up at 10, you can wake up at 10. Your bed's over there. Yeah, by the way, you know, kitchen, hey, help yourself to everything you want, okay? It's my, mi casa, su casa. I don't think that works that way, right? <laughs> so when Joseph was treated bad, he was miserable, he was in pain, and then what happened? Potiphar's wife liked what she saw. And she tried to, uh, okay, middle school kids, cover your ears, tried to, Sleep with him. Okay, that just means sleep in the same bed, okay? Understand, middle schoolers? All right? So the important thing is, <clears throat> he said no. So what did he do? She grabbed his shirt, took his shirt off. But now, Joseph ran away. So now she's stuck with Joseph's shirt. So people are going to be asking, what are you doing with Joseph's shirt? And why did Joseph run out of your room naked, half naked? So she had to explain something. So she, so she screamed, ah! Joseph tried to rape me. So he got arrested and put in prison for a crime he didn't even commit. Right? Now he's in prison. I don't know if he got prison tattoos or anything like that, but he's in prison. Understand? He was just a nice kid living a happy life, but then all of a sudden he's in a prison in Egypt. How'd that happen? That's like you coming home from school one day and eventually becoming in prison in China. Like, how'd that happen? Right? I was in Long Island at the world camp, and then I came home, and now I'm a prison in China. Right? That's basically what it's like. So now, of course, Potiphar's wife betrayed him. Potiphar's wife framed him. But where did this all come from? My brothers. If they hadn't sold me, I wouldn't have been a slave. If I wouldn't have been a slave, I wouldn't be in prison right now, isn't it? So it all came from where? His brothers. It all came from his brothers. So guess what? What would you do if you were Joseph? Joseph became governor of Egypt. Now what does that mean? Now when we read that, we think, oh, Joseph became governor of Egypt. Okay, whatever. That's like being the governor of Wichita, Kansas, right? Okay, what you have to understand is, Joseph's position is second right under the Pharaoh. Now, why is that important? Pharaoh was the king, right? Now, at that time, Egypt was the most powerful country in that region. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He had ultimate power in the most powerful country that had the most powerful army at that time. So now his brothers come to Egypt, and Joseph says, ta-da, it's me. Hey, guys. What do you think Joseph's brothers felt? Oh, my God. I mean, if Joseph was just a janitor at, like, a high school, I don't think they have to worry. What are you going to do, mop me to death? <laughs> but they were scared. Why were they scared? Because now... He's the governor. That means he could have the army right now cut off little pieces of his brothers and put them and mail them to his father. He could do that right now. You understand? So the problem is Joseph's brothers thought what? Joseph's going to kill us. Joseph's going to have revenge on us. Doesn't that make sense, though? It would make sense if Joseph wanted to kill his brothers, doesn't it? It would make complete sense. That's normal. But Joseph is not normal. Why? Because Joseph received the heart of God. Joseph realized that this was the plan of God to send him to Egypt. And through sending him to Egypt to save his family's life through the seven years of famine that are going to come. Everybody understand? So Joseph had a different heart. Joseph had the heart of God. What is that heart of God? That heart of God is different than man's heart. Why? 
That heart of God, number one, has a different wisdom than man's heart. So when Joseph, who is a man, saw the situation, his brothers hated him, his brothers sold him. So guess what? Those evil people, and I was miserable. My life as a slave was a miserable. My life in prison was miserable. So all he saw was the misery, the difficulty, the darkness, right? But what did God see? No, you have to become, you have to go to Egypt. In order to go to Egypt, you have to eventually meet Pharaoh. How are you going to meet Pharaoh? Very simply, you have to be a slave in this person's house. This person's wife's going to frame you. You have to go to prison. And when you're in prison, you'll meet the butler and the baker. You interpret their dream. And then the butler will be saved according to the dream that I give him. And then he's going to talk to Pharaoh. And then you're going to go stand by Pharaoh. And you're going to interpret his dream. And then, boom, my perfect plan is done. You understand? So guess what? Joseph's brothers hating him, selling him. That wasn't really from his brothers, was it? You understand what I'm saying? Think about it. You hate your brother, right? You hate your sister sometimes. But you never sold him as a slave. You never murdered them, right? To get to that next level, that's not normal, is it? So who actually is the one that allowed the brothers to sell Joseph? It was God. Say, what, Pastor Terry? No, God is not into human trafficking. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this particular incident, this particular specific situation, it was all the plan of who? So Joseph has to go to Egypt. You know what happens if Joseph doesn't go to Egypt? Do you know what happens? Okay. Okay. You guys decided not to answer today. This is the last day. Test here. You can't scare me now. This is the last day now. Okay, so <laughs> they're not going to starve. They're going to die. Do you understand? Who's going to die? Do you know who's going to die? Who? Why is that important? It's just one Jewish family in the whole world of families. Isn't it? Right? No? Who is going to be born through Isaac's genealogy? Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is not born, how are you going to be saved from sin? So if you think about it, God sent Joseph to Egypt for you, 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 and me. You understand? Why? Because Jesus has to be born through the genealogy of Isaac, Judah, all the way to King David. If they die in the famine, there's no King David. There's no Solomon. There's no Joseph. And then there's no Christmas cantata. Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Everybody understand? So if you look at it through man's wisdom, how can you possibly think that you can understand everything? Do you understand what I'm saying? So think about it. With our wisdom, what do we see? Hey, I'm a slave. Slavery is miserable. Slavery is horrible. Hey, I'm in prison. This is miserable. This is horrible, right? That's what you see. So based on that, you are self-centered. And based on your self-centered judgment, what do you judge? This is good or bad. This is possible or impossible. You based that judgment only on yourself. Everybody understand? Only on yourself. But God is different. You understand? Have you ever watched National Geographic? And you see the little antelope playing, the little cute little antelopes. He just got born. His legs are all wobbly. And then he starts to run and frolic and all happy. And then, boom, leopard eats it. Right? And then what do you do? You're like, shock. You're like, And the National Geographic, the Wild Kingdom, they're really good at making it all dramatic. They play like happy little kid music. Like, dee -dee 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 -dee. And then Mary goes, oh, in less than 10 minutes, the little antelope is able to frolic and play. Now, these are important hunt, you know, skills of survival for when they must run away. You know, it explains all, right? It's all nice and peaceful. And then all of a sudden, the music changes. And then the leopard comes out and he eats the little baby. What do you feel? Right? Don't you feel that way? Lions are evil. I hate Lion King now. But when I was a kid, I used to think, ah, oh, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to kill all the leopards. 
you know, you put the Braveheart paint on your face, like, your mom's like, where are you going? I'm going to pick a fight. So every, <laughs> yeah, you're too young for that, right? <laughs> None of you watched Braveheart before, right? <laughs> so the important thing is, <clears throat> If you kill all the leopards, you know what happens? Do you know what happens? The baby deers can live. Nope, they all die. You didn't know that? Because if those deer did not have a predator to manage the population, it would overpopulate, eat all the food supply, and they would all die. You understand? Yeah, so sorry, leopards are necesito, necessary. Understand? That's not by our wisdom, but that's by whose wisdom? God's wisdom. So what I'm saying is, if you want to know how to have faith, you cannot try to have faith based and centered on yourself. You have to receive the heart of God exactly as it is. Everybody understand? So you have failed yourself, but you have to realize, and this is the good news, is that God is not like you. God is very different than you. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, you know what Jesus said? Jesus prayed, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Even though Jesus was being murdered by these people, but what did he say? What did he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. God's forgiveness cannot be understood within my own forgiveness. I have to receive the forgiveness exactly as it is. That's why you are saved by faith. That's what faith is. Receiving the heart of God exactly as it is. That's as simple. Faith isn't like, yes, I believe. No, I'm going to believe. No, that's not faith. Right? That's called motivation. Faith is natural. True faith flows like water. If it's not natural, it's not real faith. When you know the heart of God, faith will arise. Hey, God forgave me. Thank you. You understand? So this is what I want to talk about. If you look here, the story that we read today was about these animals. Peter saw in a vision. Now this vision was a big sheet of blank, big blanket, and it came down, and on top of this blanket were all different kinds of animals. Everybody understand? All different kinds of animals. Now, these animals, I don't know which ones are there. It's not written in the Bible. However, I could tell and have a rough idea of what animals they are. Because when God told Peter, he said what? Rise, kill, and eat. Right? Yes? But Peter said what? Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 can't do that. Nope, cannot do that. Now, I don't know about you, but I heard some of you have actually killed your meals before. Have you ever killed your own meal? Have you ever, you've done it before, right? Uh, I saw it once in Africa. We were in Ghana, and we went to our church. We had a church called Camp. It was our church was in a village called Camp, Camp Village. So then they wanted to treat us. So they wanted to give us goat meat. So then I was like, oh, cool. We're going to eat some goat meat. And then all of a sudden, they pulled this goat on a rope. I was like, and then right in front of us, they whoosh, and they just like prepared it. I was like, huh? Because in America, our goat meat is bought in packages with like price tags on it, right? But that goat was just like, man, it's like right there. And they just like flipped it, whoosh, and then took out all of it, and they fried it, and they said, here, eat it. Yeah, now that gives a new meaning to fresh. But it's not because Peter's afraid of blood. But back then, everybody had to prepare their meat that way. That's not what the problem was. The problem is, what did Peter say? If you look here very closely, Acts chapter 10. Verse 13. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never seen anything that is common or unclean. So, in the Bible... According to the law of God, in the book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus declares the true law of God, the, all the laws that God has given us. 
Now, we're familiar with the Ten Commandments, but actually God gave us 613 laws, everything from what to eat, what to wear, how to brush your hair, all this stuff. So a one among the laws are the laws that decide which animals are clean and unclean. So there are clean animals and unclean animals. Let me ask you a question. When you were young, what did you hear about Noah's Ark? All the animals went in how many? Two by two? Well, if you look at the Bible, it says clean animals went by seven. Unclean animals went two. So there are clean animals and unclean animals in the Bible. Everybody understand? Now, this is important. According to the law, there's two standards that you must fulfill to be a clean animal if you're an animal on land. Number one, your foot, your hoof has to be divided like this. Split hoof. Everybody understand? That's like a deer, for example. A deer has a split hoof. Cow has a split hoof. Even a pig. Pig has a split hoof. However, there's a second standard. You have to chew the cud. You know what chewing the cud is? Chewing the cud basically is like a cow. A cow has like four or five stomachs. So what a cow does, if you notice, a cow's always chewing. His mouth is always moving. Right? Some of you are that way because you chew gum all day. But cow's always chewing. You know why he's always chewing? Because what it does is eat grass, chews it, swallows it, goes into stomach number one. And then they throw it back up into their mouth, chew it again, and it goes into stomach number two. And then one more time, it comes up, chew it again, and then stomach number three, stomach number four, stomach number five, and then it comes out door number five. Okay? Everybody understand? This is what chewing the cud is. Now, a cow, a deer, they chew the cud. But the problem is there are some animals that may fulfill one standard, but it doesn't fill the second standard. If it fulfills only one standard, then it is unclean. So like a pig, it has a split hoof, but the pig does not chew the cud. Everybody understand? So that is why the pig is unclean. You got it? Now, a camel. Camel chews the cud, but their hoof is not split hoof. So camels are unclean. Everybody understand? Now, there's also two standards for seafood. Number one standard, it has to have scales. Number two standard, it has to have fins. Which means, sorry to say it, but shrimp, lobster, crab is unclean. You understand? That's so disappointing. Right? So, if you want to say it that way, Red Lobster itself is an unclean restaurant. But the beautiful thing is, what about tuna? Tuna is a fish, right? It has fins, right? So it's clean, right? No, because it does not have scales. It has skin. <gasps> Say what? Yeah, it's true. It's unclean. The important thing is, there's also many rules, even about which insects you can eat. Every insect flies. You, almost every insect flies. Every insect has a set of wings, supposedly. But the, the, the insects that just crawl, they are unclean. However, the insects that jump, that leap, are clean. That's why grasshoppers, locusts are clean. You can eat them if you want. I've eaten fried grasshopper. It's not bad. So there's a lot of standards. Of every standard of what animals to eat are unclean. Now, this unclean or clean is decided by who? It's not just made up. Who established this law? God. God said that they're unclean. Everybody understand? Now, this is important. This is very, very important. Peter is correct or incorrect in saying not to eat them. He's correct. No, God. These are unclean animals. The law says they're unclean. I have never eaten anything unclean. I cannot eat these animals. What Peter is saying is correct in his own eyes. He was taught that way. Yes, it's true. That is taught to him by the law of God. However, now... This is allowing him, this is making Peter defy God right now. now. This is very careful. Listen very carefully. Peter is not incorrect. Peter's correct. The law 
says that these animals are unclean. That's true. That's undeniable. What Peter's saying is right. However, Peter's rightfulness, what Peter sees as right right now, is making him disobey God. God told Peter, kill it and eat it, right? What did Peter say? No, I can't because this is unclean. Peter is not incorrect. Peter is correct. But right now, his correctness is defying God. It's going against God. Do you know what makes God most upset? It isn't that people commit murder. It isn't that people lie. It isn't that people steal. Why, God already knows you're going to do this. Don't you think so? Right? But you know what really makes God upset? Is when you disobey God. God said, kill it and eat it. No, God. The law says I cannot. What did Peter say? I have not touched anything that is unclean. Right? So what did God say? This is important. This is what God said. Let's read the next verse. Let's start again. Verse 13, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. That's the first part of the conversation, right? Verse 13, and there came a voice unto him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And then here's Peter's response. Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, this is important. Verse 15, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. What did God just say? These animals are clean or unclean? Are they clean or unclean? You don't believe the law? You don't believe the law? You don't believe the Bible? The Bible says they're unclean, isn't it? The law says they're unclean, isn't it? Who gave the law? Isn't it? So they're clean or unclean? Unclean, right? Unclean? I just... Showed you. Unclean or clean? What? This is what I'm saying. According to the law, they are unclean. According to the physical appearance, they are unclean. According to their standard, they are unclean. Right? They don't have the split hoof. Even though the pig, he didn't start chewing the cud all of a sudden. He has a split hoof, yes, but he doesn't chew the cud, Right? But God says, oh, no, these animals are clean now. But does that mean he chews the cud now? Pig still doesn't chew the cud. The pig still does not fulfill the standard of the law, yet God called it clean. You understand? But why is that difficult for Peter to accept? Because Peter doesn't understand how you can do that. But the law still says we're unclean. The law still says that the pig is unclean. Look. The pig didn't change. The pig's still the same. Right? Isn't it? A pig is still a pig. But what did God say? No. This pig is now clean. Right? Am I right? This is very important. We have to end soon. So we're going to do a little bit of emergency Bible reading right now. Okay, let us open the Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Let's read it. Here's what Jesus says. Now, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus is talking about this in Matthew chapter 5, which is the servant sermon on the mount. This is what Jesus says. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 18. Ready? Ready? Go. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be. Now this is important. The law is still here, isn't it? 
So according to the law, are you clean or unclean? Unclean. You kept the law? Did you lie? Did you steal? Did you hate? So the law declares you as clean or unclean? Unclean. But it says here, the law, as long as the law lasts, you are? You are what? Unclean. Isn't it? That's why it makes sense, right? That's why you say, yes, see, pastor, that's why I'm a sinner. Because as long as the law says that I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. You are correct. You are correct. You are right. However, just what you have to understand. Now let's look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. If you look at Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Look here. Ready? Let's read this together. Ready? Go. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What does that mean? Because you don't know about God's righteousness, that's why you have to make your own. Why are you trying to wash away your sin? You're trying to wash away your sin, not because you're a noble person, not because you're a good person. Everything's self-centered, right? You're self-motivated. Why are you trying to wash away your sin? Very simply, because in your heart, you don't believe that Jesus already made you righteous. So because you're ignorant of God's righteousness, you have to work for your own righteousness. Everybody understand? That's what it says, right? But this is very important. Let's read verse 4. Verse 4. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Let's read it together loudly. Ready? Go. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Oh, here we go. Matthew chapter 5 says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to what? Fulfill the law. And it says that until the law is completely fulfilled, this law will never disappear. Yes? Yes? Am I right? Now, here's the problem. You broke the law, right? I broke the law, right? We did not fulfill the law. Amen? But here's the problem, though. According to that law, what's supposed to happen to you? You're condemned by the law, right? You're condemned to die. But guess what? Jesus died on the cross. For who? Exactly, right? He died for you, yes? What does that mean? Who fulfilled the law? Who fulfilled it? Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't just say, I forgive you. He didn't just say you're washed. He actually did the work of fulfilling the law, everyone. And when he fulfilled the law, what does it say, verse 4? Verse 4. Let's repeat. One more time. Let's read it together. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That's why God says, do not call this unclean anymore because I have made it clean. Amen. Everyone. I'm not saying this. Jesus is telling you that I have fulfilled the law. Now let's talk about it. One last verse and we'll finish. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 and then we'll finish. Whew, I have two minutes left. Jeremiah. Chapter 31, we'll start reading from verse 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Here we go. Now, this is very important. Look very carefully. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, why do we need a new, new covenant? Because the old one doesn't work, right? Isn't it? No. You know why we have a new covenant? 
Because Jesus already fulfilled the old one. What's the old covenant? The law, isn't it? The Ten Commandments, the law, sacrifices, right? What we just read, what did we just read? We just read that Jesus fulfilled the old covenant. So now the old covenant is done. It's finished, right? Yes? Now there's a new covenant. What's the new covenant? Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand of hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although a husband unto them, thus saith the Lord. So it's a different kind of covenant, right? The first covenant was based on whether you do well or not. Am I right? But this is a different kind of covenant. Not like the old one. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, it says that I will put their law in their hearts. I will write it in your heart. A new law, right? A new law. What is the new law? Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's the new law. Everybody understand? That is the new covenant. The old covenant, we broke it, but Jesus fulfilled it. So now that the old covenant is gone, what happened to that thing that made us unclean? Where is that official standard that says that we are unclean? Where is it? It's nailed to the cross. So guess what? That is why in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, what does it say? Therefore, in Christ, there is no more condemnation. Amen? So everyone, you know what's going to happen? God's going to show me a vision one day. He's going to be like, hey, shake mercy's hand. And I'm going to say, no, I never touched anyone unclean or common. And you know what God's going to say? What God's going to say? Don't call what I have clean, common, or unclean. Amen? I cannot say she's a sinner anymore. Why? Because God made her righteous. I cannot say that. Even though I'm a pastor, I cannot tell her, hey, you're a sinner. God says, no, oh, I made her clean. If I cannot say it, you cannot say it either. Everybody understand? Everyone, it's not about what you do. The reason why we have suffering is because we do not believe in God. God is not like us. Just because you cannot Make yourself clean doesn't mean God cannot. But the Bible clearly says, your sins and iniquities I remember no more. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled every jot, every tittle of the requirement of the law. Everybody understand? Everyone, I hope that you will take this faith into your heart. And then God's word will free you from sin. Everyone, do you know why I'm a pastor? I'm a pastor not because I love God. I'm a pastor because this is how God's word had changed me. Everyone, I didn't want to be a pastor. didn't even dream to be a pastor. But one by one, God started changing my life. God got rid of my hate. There were times that hate arose in my heart, but that hate never stayed. God always removed it. God always planted his heart in my heart. Why? Because God made me clean. Therefore, God has to be responsible for me. Everybody understand? God is the one that's going to lead you. Everybody understand? Everyone, trust God. Believe in God, not yourself. So I hope that you will keep this faith in your heart. Let us pray. We'll finish here. Let us pray. Dear God, we truly thank you for blessing us during this world camp. Lord, because we struggled and we failed, because we did so many times failing ourselves, being failed by other people. Lord, we thought that this was what was going to happen if we trust the word. But Lord, the word is different. The word will be fulfilled. The word is guaranteed by you, not by man. So Lord, I pray that you allow this word to enter each and every heart of all the young people here and let this word carry the hearts of the students here. 
that they will no longer be tied down to sin, no longer be led by condemnation, but that you would give them the freedom and the faith that you have made them righteous. God, we truly thank you and ask that you continue to bless them for the remainder of this camp, but also beyond this camp. God, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, let's finish.